Thank you. Uh, I'm honored to take part in the first international conference uh, of the School of Linguistics and Translation at uh, Badir University in Cairo. Uh, I'd like to begin by thanking Professor Fadwa Kamal Abdulrahman and Nehad Mohammed uh, for all their help and for inviting me, as well as the organizers, participants, students, and faculty. I'm only sorry that I have to operate remotely and online here in my home office, uh, but I hope that someday I'll be able to visit Cairo and the university in person. Um, my talk is uh, titled, Is the World a Place? Cosmopolitanism and Literature After the Spatial Turn. Um, sorry. So in, in the past few decades, the spatial turn in the arts, humanities, and social sciences has been marked by an enhanced awareness of the significance of space, place, mapping, social relations, uh, spatial relations, and so on. Rather than functioning as a mere setting, a container or backdrop, space has been shown to have active, an active and productive presence in society and culture, as well as in various art forms. Recently, perhaps relatedly, a planetary turn in many of these disciplinary fields has reoriented spatial critical theory and practice towards a more global frame of reference, owing much to the imperatives of ecological crisis uh, and the prospects of an apparently inevitable climate change, as well as to the realities of multinational capitalism and globalization. The conception of the world, which can be closely related to both spatiality and planetarity, profoundly influences the way we imagine space and place. Worlds may be either vaster or more limited than, their spatial than other spatial frameworks, and the negotiation of worldly spaces presents challenges to the traditional means of mapping or making sense of one's place. This in turn seems to be a crucial matter for considerations of international dialogue and exchange in the present world historical configuration for ours is a global space, a planet and a world in which innumerable and conflicting worldviews commingle. The cosmopolitan prospect thus appears at once both inevitable given the interconnectedness of our various societies and utopian, given the radical differences among them. In this presentation, I will discuss the effects of uh, worlding on spatiality studies, beginning with a discussion of the spatial and planetary turns, then focusing on the crises of representation and of lived experience connected with such global frame, uh, frames of reference. Along the way, I hope to show that world literature offers a promising perspective on cosmopolitanism and international dialogue, well suited to our own postmodern condition. Although spatial or geographical considerations have no doubt always been part of literary and critical practice, the recent resurgence of spatiality in, and the explosion in the number of spatially oriented books and articles in literary studies appear to be the result of what some have referred to as the spatial turn in the humanities and social sciences. The spatial turn has no particular date of inception, but one may perceive more and more critical attention being paid to matters of space in the 1970s and 1980s, for example, uh, in what has become a very famous lecture from 1967, Michel Foucault declared our age to be, quote, the epoch of space. Tellingly, perhaps, the lecture was only published shortly before Foucault's death in 1984 and appeared in English as Of Other Spaces only in 1986. Uh, Foucault's research into the birth of the prison and other matters of the 1970s led to some of the already spatially oriented thinkers' most overtly spatial work which has in turn influenced spatiality studies across uh, numerous disciplinary fields in recent years. Another major contribution that was also somewhat belatedly recognized outside of France was only uh, Henri Lefebvre's uh, influential uh, study, The Production of Space, uh, 
published in 1974, but uh, translated into English only in 1991. Uh, sticking with Frenchman for a moment, uh, the work of Gilles Deleuze, and perhaps especially in his collaborations with Félix uh, Gattari, uh, increasingly couched his arguments in spatial or geographical terms. And the two uh, together uh, embraced uh, a form of geophilosophy in their book, What is Philosophy? These thinkers, among others, were part of and influential upon the spatial turn as it developed in other areas in the past few decades. For example, the geographer Dennis Cosgrove explicitly connects the spatial turn to post-structuralist theory of the sort seen in, in, in those authors, among others. Uh, as Cosgrove put it, quote, a widely acknowledged spatial turn across arts and sciences corresponds to post-structuralist ag agnosticism about both naturalistic and universal explanations and about single-voiced historical narratives and to the concomitant recognition that position and context are centrally and inescapably implicated in all constructions of knowledge." End quote. At the same time, the transformative research in the social sciences, such as that of Anthony Giddens or David Harvey, Ed, Edward Soja, emphasized and insisted upon the need to consider spatial relations and planning in order to comprehend facts and trends in social theory. Although not all would embrace the terms postmodern or postmodernism, which have been used to characterize both the historical period and an aesthetic style, um, among other things, of course, uh, the advent of post, uh, the postmodern is closely tied to what has been understood as the spatial turn. Uh, art and architecture, always attuned to matters of spatiality and relations of space, appear to have been, uh, become more emphatically interested in spatiality in the postmodern condition. For instance, Frederick Jameson's analysis of postmodernity memorably employed uh, the figure uh, of a work of postmodern architecture, the Bonaventure Hotel in Los Angeles, as his point of departure for discussing the advent of postmodern hyperspace and its bewildering effects on human perception and subjective experience. Um, Jameson later referred to this uh, in terms of that, quote, new spatiality implicit in the postmodern. The subtitle of Edward Soja's magnificent 1989 study, Postmodern Geographies, announced, quote, the reassertion of space in critical and social theory. Uh, and Harvey's The Condition of Postmodernity from the same year connected the postmodern with the space-time compression associated with global capitalism. In this way, the confluence of post-structuralist theory and postmodern theorizing helped to characterize key aspects of the spatial turn more broadly. Interestingly enough, Amid all the spatially oriented critical theory and practice, the concept of space remained largely on the margins of most uh, discourse in cultural studies and literary studies. Sometimes a trope uh, only becomes noticeable after the turn, one might say. For example, a significant collection of essays designed to register the field altering changes to literary studies in the aftermath of theory, uh, uh, titled Critical Terms for Literary Study, 1990, edited by Franklin Trickia and Thomas McLaughlin, uh, contain no entries for space or place, mapping, or geography. Raymond Williams's influential keywords, 1975, notwithstanding the fact that its very project arose from the country and the city, perhaps Williams's most overtly spatial or literary geographical work, keywords also contain no entry for space or place. The second edition, published in 1983, included 21 additional entries, but space and place remained absent. Harvey himself felt the need to redress this omission in an essay titled Space as a Keyword which began by stating that, quote, if Raymond Williams were contemplating the entries for his celebrated text on keywords today, 
he would have surely included the word space. Uh, Nigel Thrift, in a 2006 essay with the deceptively simple keyword-like title of just space, uses this rough span of, uh, quote, the last 20 years or so uh, to cover the spatial turn in the humanities and the social sciences. And Thrift predicts in that essay that the relatively recent critical phenomenon will have lasting results on how we think of ourselves and the world. The University of Pittsburgh's Keywords Project which is intended to update Raymond Williams' work and which has resulted in the publication uh, recently of uh, a book, Keywords for Today, a 21st Century Vocabulary, edited by Colin McCabe and uh, Hannah Janicek, um, still contains no entry for space, place, or mapping. Needless to say, perhaps prior to the spatial turn, there were many critical practices that were in one way or another, already attuned to matters of space, place, and geography. For example, uh, urban studies, regionalism, genre studies based on geography, such as pastoral poetry, say, uh, landscape studies, post-colonial theory, investigations of spatial form, and so forth, have registered space as a key element uh, of uh, the field of literary studies. Many of these subfields of practices continue to produce valuable scholarship for students and critics interested in spatial studies today. Literature as a disciplinary field of study has a long history of examining such geographically based questions as the relation of an author to or a text to its city, region, or nation. Uh, partially as a result of the spatial turn, these older practices have themselves recently become reinvigorated with, uh, with an assertion of new models or frames of reference. The fundamentally spatial or geographical question of mobile populations and border crossing has opened up new areas uh, for transnational perspectives, which has not only created different categories for understanding formerly homogenous literatures and cultures, say, for example, diaspora studies or mestiza cultures or uh, in the US uh, and England, uh, English departments studying the Black Atlantic, for example. Um, but also uh, uh, along these lines, uh, these approaches have fashioned new lenses through which to view older fields, as may be seen in recent versions of hemispheric, transnational or post-colonial American studies in the United States. In the aftermath of the spatial turn, a planetary turn has caused many of the traditional discourses within modern language and literary studies to make fascinating connections among the local, regional, national, and global circuits of cultural production. In her provocative call for a new comparative literature, Death of a Discipline, Gayatri Spivak proposes uh, planetarity as the transnational figure around which to organize the study of world li literatures and languages. In naming this figure, she hoped to, quote, overwrite another more pervasive one, namely uh, the global, which in an era of globalization had come to dominate critical social, uh, critical social and cultural theory. As Spivak puts it, quote, Globalization is the imposition of the same system of exchange everywhere. In the grid work of electronic capital, we achieve that abstract ball uh, covered in latitudes and longitudes cut by virtual lines, once the equator and the tropics and so on, now drawn by the requirements of geographical positioning systems. To talk planet talk by way of an unexamined environmentalism referred to uh, an undivided natural space rather than a differentiated political space, um, can work in the interest of this globalization in the mode of the abstract as such. The globe is on our computers. No one lives there. It allows us to think that we can aim to control it. The planet, on the contrary, she says, is in a, a species of alterity belonging to another system, and yet we inhabit it on loan, end quote. 
Planetarity would therefore go beyond the merely transnational, regional, or continental frames of reference, which have been used in traditional comparative literature and area studies, as Y. Chi Demick's invocation of a literature for the planet uh, uh, suggests, the planet as a unit of analysis would necessarily require both temporal and spatial coordinates as a global relationship necessarily involves a scope extended beyond the borders of national language or political organization. Spivak's sense of the planet or of planetarity as a site of otherness that somehow is also a home resonates especially well in a moment uh, in which the dramatic transformations of culture and society caused or at least occasioned by the forces of globalization have generated considerable existential anxiety, not to mention a pessimism of the intellect accompanied by an apparent paralysis of the will. Such a moment calls for new ways of imagining the world, new methods of analysis, interpretation and evaluation, and new forms of collective action. One recent attempt to think through this comes from a, a collection of essays titled the planetary term, relation, relationality and geoesthetics in the 21st century, which is uh, edited by Amy J. Elias and Christian Moraru. Um, there, uh, the authors attempt to elaborate the potential effectiveness of planetary criticism for the present spatiotemporal situation. The planetary term simultaneously develops an argument in favor of a planetary criticism and through its diversity of contributors and essay topics, demonstrates the range and flexibility of a planetary approach to the arts, literature, and culture. The collection offers uh, an incisive and expansive uh, perspective on the ways in which, uh, quote, a planetary imaginary has emerged in the 21st century and on the prospects for effective planetary criticism that can grapple with the challenges of this age. In their lengthy, lucid introduction to the planetary turn, Elias and Moraru elaborate the terms of our present planetary condition and argue for a planetary criticism appropriate to it. They begin by distinguishing the planetary from two other seemingly similar paradigms of cultural and critical theory today, globalization and cosmopolitanism. Following Spivak, among others, Elias and Moraro see globalization as a homogenizing system, uh, understand primar uh, understood primarily in terms of finance, economics, or technology, whereas the planetarity uh, is supposed to operate in, in a more open field, a commons in which ethics and relationality define the parameters of the discussion with meaningful connections to sort of post-humanism environmentalism and uh, ecology against the cosmopolitan model, uh, according to Elias Moraru, which establishes a mindset of enlightened border crossing, travel and contact. Planetarity instantiates the basic commonality of planetary space as a shared resource. Envisioning a world commons the proponents of planetarity imagine, quote, a complex planetary network, including nested but non-hierarchical cultural and material ecosystems, communal constellations, sites, and forms of life ranging in scale, but acknowledging, serving, and honoring a shared, affectively, and materially interrelated uh, inhabited world space, end quote. Hence, while a planetary criticism must grapple with the same or similar conditions that critical discourses around globalization or cosmopolitanism uh, have countenanced, the movement away from homogenizing or potentially Western-centered models might make possible new ways of dealing with that uh, spatio-temporal situation in which we find ourselves in our post-modern condition. If all this sounds cautiously exploratory, as Elias and Moraru concede, uh, 
That's because the discursive uh, and disciplinary field in question is as yet still emergent. Cosmopolitanism, whether connected to globalization or not, has a much longer history, even as its the theorization and practices continue to develop in new directions. Cosmopolitanism uh, as a concept or as a Weltanschauung or worldview uh, has always involved a spatial element, which is not uh, merely geographical, but also more theoretical. With respect to physical geography and social space, cosmopolitanism finds its proper place in the great worldly cities, as the very word suggests. That is, the term derives from the combination of the Greek cosmos, or world, and polites, or citizen, the latter being understood as one with full standing as a resident of a polis or city. To a certain extent, then, the cosmopolitan is not merely a citoyen uh, du monde, uh, uh, the French term from the early 19th century, social idealist, but also uh, the inhabitant of something like a world city, more frequently understood as a metropolis than as a cosmopolis. The rise of the global city, as Saskia Sassen has dubbed it, emphasizes the cosmopolitan character further, as these cities become crucial nodes in a worldwide system of production, circulation, distribution, and communication. Such world cities or cosmopolises very much determine the shape and meaning of the experience of life on this planet in the 21st century. Hence, one might say that cosmo, uh, cosmopolitanism is implicated within a distinctively urban space, even if this sort of city space is imaginary. And this may frequently uh, be understood only negatively, for example, by imagining those spaces and places that are not cosmopolitan, rustic locales or small towns are often, along with provinces and provinciality, you know, regions, uh, especially uh, nation states, most salient um, uh, mo nation, nation states, which are the most salient of modern uh, spatio-political formations, and which so infrequently uh, entangle notions of race, identity, and so on with, with, within it. These are social and spatial formations that, uh, if not antithetical to cosmopolitanism, that at least uh, seem to be at odds with it. The city, however, is marked by a certain cosmopolitanism. This is especially the case with a very large city, the metropolis, or if smaller, the city that is strategically located as a nexus of trade, transportation, or communication, such as the port city. Sites of contact between cultures, heterotopias that engender different ways of seeing social space, such cities affect the very fabric of the global economy while also contributing to the manner in which our world is understood. In these spaces, difference arises and relates. Along these lines, cosmopolitan space, it seems, must also imply a sort of utopian space. It is a space that is at once a non-place and a good place to cite the well-known homophonic pun of Thomas More's initial coining of the term, that is to say the word utopia combining the utopos, O-U topos, with the U topos, E-U topos from the original Greek um, that would allow the same word to seem to say no place and good place at the same time. Utopias are famous for not actually existing, of course. They are viewed as being aspirational, critical, satirical, or fanciful, but they are always also understood to be unreal. In some respects, the cosmopolitan is equally unreal, insofar as the ideals of the world city and its global citizen never fully match up to the reality of life in the metropolitan center or in the far-flung periphery. In this world as we know it, there really uh, is no truly cosmopolitan place 
although any number of places and spaces may partake of some kind of cosmopolitanism or other, one might say that the, the desire for cosmopolitan space is a feature of our contemporary apprehension of space and place in an era of globalization. Hence Marx's insistence on the cosmopolitan character of capitalism, which certainly begins and flourishes in a largely national and nationalistic social context, but which in the hands of the bourgeoisie increasingly supersedes its nat national boundaries in pushing production and consumption ever into the world. In their brief consideration of the world market in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels praised the revolutionary and dominant bourgeoisie of the 19th century for giving society its, quote, cosmopolitan character, by which they mean suppressing, if not eliminating, the distinctively national and therefore reactionary character. As they write, quote, the bourgeoisie has through its exploitation of the world market given a cosmopolitan character to production and consumption in every country. To the great chagrin of the, of the reactionists, it is drawn from under the feet of industry, the national ground on which it stood. All old established national boundaries have been destroyed or are daily being destroyed. They are dislodged by new industries whose introduction becomes life and death question for all civilized nations by industries that no longer work up indigenous raw material, but raw material drawn from the remotest zones, industries whose products are consumed not only at home, but in every quarter of the globe. In place of the old wants satisfied by the production of the country, we find new wants requiring for their satisfaction the products of distant lands and climes. In place of the old local and national seclusion and self-sufficiency. We have intercourse in every direction, universal interdependence of nations. Marx and Engels go on to explicitly link these developments to, of political economy to a sort of cultural cosmopolitanism as well. Quote, and as in the material, so also in the intellectual production, the intellectual creations of individual nations become common property national one-sidedness and narrow-mindedness become more and more impossible. And from the numerous national and local literatures, there arises a world literature." End quote. The language used in this paragraph is telling and it reveals the extent to which the authors themselves not only value cosmopolitanism, but view it as essential to the development of a revolutionary working class movement. Here, the better known imaginary space of the nation must give way to the perplexities and convolutions of a more global space, which also appears to have an increasingly urban character, such that even the languages and literatures are affected by the permutations of the world market. The study of world literature, and of course that term world literature, Weltliteratur, is used by Marx and Engels in what I quoted, the study of world literature, which perhaps coincidentally has also become a more dominant discourse in the humanities after or alongside the spatial turn, would seem to require a sense of cosmopolitanism. And yet the national does not yield its ground quite so easily as Marx or others may imagine. It is perhaps noteworthy that Christian Thorne, in an essay on the ways in which the novel has remained tied to the uh, conceptual space of the nation state and cannot seem to adequately represent a supranational or global sphere. Christian Thorne titles this exploration of his subject, The Sea is Not a Place. And here the sea is understood as a truly transnational domain set apart from, but also connecting, the nations of the world. In a way, this brings us back to the planet as a material embodiment of the globe or the world. In his essay titled Decompressing Culture, Three Steps Towards a Geo-Methodology, Moraru briefly sketches the outlines of his conception of, quote, planetary reading, noting that, quote, the planet serves increasingly and with his, uh, historically unrivaled force as a level matrix or condition of the possibility 
for a forma mentis whose purview covers the conceptual, philosophical, the referential or scientific, as well as the aesthetic or imaginative. Moretti suggests three provincial, uh, provisional, I'm sorry, steps towards a methodology suited to the present planetary condition. In brief, they are uh, topological, connecting the planet itself to the spatialization of the wor world, structural, relational, linking uh, the parts uh, both to each other and to the whole, and ethical, inasmuch as a geo-methodological approach would not only read the symptoms of planetarity in a given text or territory, but would also read it, quote, on behalf of the planet, uh, such that criticism can coincide with a form of stewardship. Here, a sort of ecological imperative combines with the cosmopolitan ideals of the international dialogue and exchange, um, such that uh, reading for the planet would become a somewhat uh, ecological concern as well as critical concern. Whether ours is an age of planetarity or something else, a spatially oriented planetary criticism can bring together the disparate yet clearly interrelated theories and methods of world systems theory, area studies, uh, comparative and world literature, geocriticism and spatiality studies, ecocriticism and environmentalism, cosmopolitanism and globalization. As Spivak observed, the planet is simultaneously otherworldly, quote, a species of alterity, but it's also our home. And any literary or cultural criticism in the age of globalization, with its persistently post national forces, hybrid forms, and situations of transgressivity may well need to take into account the current condition of the planet, not to mention its historical formulations, formations, and its potential future. As noted above all, uh, I'm sorry, as noted above, part of the problem with imagining the entire globe or planet as the frame of reference for cultural analysis is the sheer vastness of the space along with the indescribably complex relations of power that make it a world. Thorne's observation that, quote, the sea is not a place, corresponds to the planet whose surface is more than two thirds water. Traditionally, in both geographic and political imagination, the sea is not really a place in and of itself. Looking at the physical map or nautical chart, the vast blue watery space is largely a backdrop upon which the terrestrial features or places, islands, coastlines, reefs, even shallows, are figured or marked. The sea, somewhat like that inky night sky, sky for the stargazer, represents so much space between and among various places, but does not quite appear as a place, and yet it is absolutely crucial to the human experience. The ocean represents what uh, Siobhan Carroll has referred to as an atopia or a non-place, far more hostile and resistant to cartographic representation and to homely experience than those that Marc Auger had examined in his um, influential book, uh, Non-Places, the Introduction to Supermodernity. As Carroll observes, quote, Natural atopias, like the North Pole, the ocean, the atmosphere, the desert, or the subterranean, are unusual forms of space that, because of their physical features or environmental conditions, resist being converted into the sites of affective habituation, I'm sorry, habitation, that we call place. Still quoting Carroll, of these spaces, the paradigmatic atopia the one that continues to influence our conceptualization of unfamiliar spaces is the ocean. It plays this role in part because of its significant role in legal and political history. On the one hand, the ocean has always been essential to travel, global trade, and imperial conquest. On the other, its fluidity has posed substantial challenges 
to states seeking to extend land-based power across its surface. End quote. In an obvious but also odd way, the ocean lacks territoriality. And yet, it is also a space subjected to ever more complicated and nuanced forms of territorialization over human history. For example, where Stuart Eldon's uh, The Birth of the Territory reveals the long processes by which the Earth's terrestrial spaces were transformed into territories in the full sense of that word, Philip E. Steinberg in The Social Construction of the Ocean has demonstrated the manner by which oceanic spaces have been produced over time and across social orders in accordance with different modes of production. So much of the world's surface is covered by this oceanic space where so little can be seen or mapped that it really ought to be central to any discussions of social and natural spaces, and yet it has frequently been relegated to the margins of land-based places, inhabitable and uninhabitable alike, uh, which take precedence in spatiality studies, for the most part. In her call for a more materialist approach to oceanic studies, Hester Bloom has rightly noted that, quote, the sea is not a metaphor. Figurative language has its place in the analyses of, maritime, of the maritime world, certainly, but oceanic studies could be more invested in the uses and problems of what is literal in the face of the sea's abyss of representation, end quote. And yet, even with the historicist and materialist perspective, one that focuses on the actual lives and records of sailors, for example. This sense of placelessness in oceanic spaces has a real topophrenic consequences, which are related to challenges to literary and graphic representation in the form of mapping. Take the English expression, to be at sea, which is fundamentally synonymous with being lost or bewildered. One's sense of being dangerously out of place is intensified in the vast abyssal zones associated with the ocean, which in turn may be transcoded into a larger world system in need of cognitive mapping, to cite Jameson's well-known term. Ultimately, a form of global cognitive mapping would be necessary to make sense of this vast world system and our place within it, which in turn are crucial questions for a spatially oriented cultural criticism in the 21st century. That is because even at the more local level, the global system operates and affects us. Jameson's older example, which was based on an earlier stage of globalization, one far less uh, complex and extensive than our own, nevertheless provides some indication of the underlying problem. Jameson gave an example from the um, early 20th century, and he's argued that the age of imperialism or of monopoly capitalism brought about a schism between the truth, uh, between truth and experience, where the material conditions for the possibility of an individual's lived experience in the Metropolitan Center, for example, are actually to be found in the far-flung colonial elsewhere. As Jameson puts it, quote, the phenomenological experience of the individual subject, traditionally the supreme raw material for a work of art, becomes limited to a tiny corner of the social world, a fixed camera view of a certain section of London or of the countryside or whatever. But the truth of that experience no longer coincides with the place in which it takes place. The truth of that limited experience of London lies rather in India or Jamaica or Hong Kong, it is bound up with the whole colonial system of which the British Empire, of the British Empire, that determines the very quality of the individual's subjective life. Yet those structural coordinates are no longer accessible to immediate lived experience and are not even conceptualizable by most people, uh, end quote. For Jameson, the stylistic innovations of literary modernism were attempts to deal with this existential condition effectively operating as strat strategies of containment, which repressed the historical and political content of the novels. However much more uh, intricate and complicated uh, is today's world system, um, 
uh, when not only uh, many raw materials, but virtually everything one encounters is bound up within this global network. As Jamison notes uh, much more recently in Allegory and Ideology, the real and conceptual vastness of a global system is not just spatial, but also social. Quote, today in an era of full globalization, the distance between the life of concrete social networks and population size is so great as to be virtually unconceptualizable. This is uh, an aspect of just living in a planet with so many people and so, so vast a system. Any project of cognitive mapping would have to account for the space of the world system as we attempt to know it, which is to say global and perhaps super, even supraplanetary or cosmic space. Given the importance of satellites, along with underwater transoceanic fiber optic cables, to our day-to-day -day activities and to the most ordinary experiences imaginable, like placing phone calls or purchasing goods or giving a talk using uh, telecommunications technology, uh, one might say that the terrestrial globe, though vast, is still too limited a space by which to understand or map our present postmodern condition. But such a problem project would also have to deal with the social and political aspects of that system, which move beyond the geographical register, forcing us to confront weirder questions entirely. For example, as Jameson asks in his back cover endorsement of Alberto Toscano and Jeff Kinkle's book, uh, Cartographies of the Absolute, quote, how much of capitalism can we see from the moon? Such a question is the stuff of science fiction or fantasy, and yet is also very much part of the world that spatiality studies must analyze and theorize in the years to come. The literature of this world system cannot help but be more worldly, as will be its readers, so greater communication and exchange is all the more desirable and all the more necessary. Thank you.